Now, one thing is for sure, artificial intelligence is an essential part of our lives and it will be increasingly so, and that is for better or for worse. Today, we're launching Toby's latest book, Machines Behaving Badly. And because we're attempting perhaps even the impossible of having a super hybrid event, we hope they will be performing on the right side of badly. So, well, for us today, but if there are little uh, things going wrong, like extra little beeps and so on, let's just enjoy the process as we hurdle mm -hmm. into the hybrid world that this all represents. The questions such as Alexia, is she racist? Can robots have rights? Right. What but what happens when self-driving cars kill somebody? And, you know, what limits should be placed on facial recognition are all questions that hopefully we'll explore today. So a little bit about our speakers. Toby Walsh, or Professor Walsh. Toby, happy to call Toby? Toby, please. Okay, it's, it's been like that for a while. Um, so Toby is the an ARC Laureate Fellow and Scientia Professor of AI at the University of New South Wales and is also with CSIRO. Data 61, an adjunct professor of QP2. He's a strong advocate for limit to ensure AI is used to improve our lives, having spoken to the UN and also heads the state and parliamentary, and so also spoken to heads of state, parliamentary bodies, and company boards on these and many other issues. He's a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science and was named on the international who's who of AI list of influence. He's authored three books on AI, all fantastic, I have to say, and the most recent is entitled Machines Behaving Badly, The Morality of AI, which will be published tomorrow. If you like a discount on that, we'll be circulating um, a, a discount too. Please encourage everyone to read it. I bought it for my nephews and they're enjoying them greatly. So Bonnie uh, Shaw, who we'll be uh, presenting today and asking uh, Toby all the hard questions, is the co-founder and chief impact officer of Place Intelligence. Bonnie, it's wonderful for you to join us and to agree to do this. Um, so a little about Place Intelligence. In 2021, it was the startup of the year and geo AI startup that provides advanced intelligence about our rapidly changing urban environments to help practitioners deliver evidence-based design, targeted investment, efficient resource allocation, and effective management to support better outcomes for people and planet. I like to think of it as smart cities um, plus, and, and that's certainly some of the work that Bonnie does over in Melbourne. An incredibly impressive CV, Bonnie, um, just some highlights. Um, the, you've worked at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London, the Sensible Cities Lab at MIT, uh, you're an adjunct professor at Georgetown University and the Melbourne Business School, and you delivered the first hackathon at the Obama White House, uh, which helped promote women into public office. Um, I see you as an environmentalist and urban cities guru, and so we're absolutely thrilled that you're here to grill Toby on his book. Um, Today's event uh, is truly hybrid. It's a little bit of an experiment, so enjoy it with us. And fingers crossed, as I mentioned before, that the machines will behave well. Um, <laughs> but that's a question for Toby. <laughs> is it possible? Um, I think that's that's all I really wanted to say. Um, but in terms of proceedings, uh, we will have a fire, or let's say a computer side chat between Toby and Bonnie. Uh, Tony, Toby, you'll be staring at this screen so you can see each other's reactions. Um, and then we'll move to question time. If you have a question and you're online, please put that in the chat function, which we'll be looking at. Um, and if it's in the room, and, and if you can't hear the question in the room, uh, Bonnie will we'll send them your way, either myself or Amanda. Um, thank you. So after the computer side chat, it'll be over to you, Amanda, to, to wrap things up and also to advise of future events. Thank you, and we're now underway. All the best. Thank you, Toby. Thank you. Before we start, uh, can I acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation, and also acknowledge uh, especially the people who came out today. It's wonderful to see a, a room full of uh, people, um, some old faces I recognise, and some new faces as well. So, um, it's wonderful to be up on stage again for the first time in two years. <laughs> Hi, Tony. How are you doing? Nice to meet you. Uh, it's very nice to see you again. Um, I'd just like to start also by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm calling in from today. 
the Woiwurrung, Boomerang and Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation um, pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, and would also uh, equally like to welcome um, my fellow people online. Uh, it looks like there's about 100 people um, joining us um, from various places around the internet. Um, and so I think we're equally matched uh, with our people in the room and, and on the web as well. Um, so uh, we've got a, a good hybrid event going on here. Um, I count myself as pretty lucky because I, I think I'm probably one of the few people that's had the opportunity to read your book uh, before most other people. Uh, it's a cracking read. Um, I got through it like a hot knife through butter. Um, <laughs> it was super accessible, um, but for someone I, I consider myself fairly well versed in, in this topic. Um, I learned a lot, but also feel like it's um, a, a really accessible read. Um, and I, I wanted to maybe just kick off my round of questions by understanding who your intended reader was when you when you were putting this together. Who did you have in mind? Oh, that, that's a, it's an interesting question. Um, I, I, I think I was trying to write. The, the, I mean, the interesting thing is when you write a book, there's a a, a fictional person in your mind that you're writing to, and it's none of the people you know because they would so, be so embarrassing to, to be writing with. And, and I'm writing really for, for the general public in the sense that I think these are technologies, as Marina said, that are going to touch all of our lives. It's hard to think of an aspect of our lives. You know. And it shouldn't be just tech people like myself making the decisions, and the book goes into a lot of examples of where it has previously for you, just take people making decisions about how the technology is used, design decisions that go into it. Um, it should be all of us making this decision because ultimately we are building a future. Um, and people ask me, people always ask me, well, what's the future going to be like? And I, I always try and remind people that the future is entirely what you want it to be. It is the product of the decisions you make today. And there are lots of choices to be made and lots of different futures. The book talks about some of those different futures. Some of them are good. And equally, some of them are, are very dystopian. It's all about us as a society, and that means everyone making the right choices. So I, I, it's written for politicians, it's written for um, concerned parents, it's written for um, CEOs of companies, um, it's, it's written for um, the, the man and the woman in the street to read, uh, and, and, and young children as well, hopefully, because it's their future that we're messing up at the moment. Yeah, amazing. So I'm, I'm trained as a landscape architect and urban designer originally, but I've spent most of my career working in the design and adoption of advanced technologies, as Marina said, in this area that's now commonly known as smart cities. Um, and I find that I'm often sitting in this kind of space of tension, mediating between the precise, clean, technical models of machine learning and AI, um, and this very messy, complex, often wildly irrational human system of the physical world and the communities that we live in. Um, in the introduction to this book, uh, you quote Neil Postman, um, the best way to view technology. A wonderful essay that I encourage everyone to go and read. Was, was it five, le five lessons from technological change? Yes, there's some. Uh, it's a, it was a commencement speech he gave 20, 30, 25, 30 years ago. Um, and you can find copies of it on the internet. It is a fantastic read about how we should think carefully about the technology we let into our lives. Um, can I, I can I paraphrase a piece that just really yes. stuck with me? I thought it was a beautiful way of introducing this work. The best way to view technology as a, is as a strange intruder. To remember that technology is not part of God's plan, but a product of human creativity and hubris and that its capacity for good or evil rests entirely on human awareness of what it does for us and to us. And I, I know I'm bringing my own bias um, to my experience of your book, but it seems to me that a lot of what you're exploring here is that tension space, that interface between design and development of the technologies and then the application um, and interaction with their lives. And so I wondered maybe if you could kind of kick us off by talking about how you're aiming to open our eyes to this strange intruder through this work. Yeah. 
Well, I think we've all had our eyes open. So, I mean, the last two years have, have been very painful, difficult experience for everyone. But there are, I think there are a few um, silver linings to the, to the pain that we've all gone through collectively around the planet. And one of them was, was a, a rediscovery of what makes, what makes our lives and communities tick. When we were locked up, when we were physically forced to stay at home, we, we realized the things that we value weren't the bits of technology, although the technology bits of technology were really useful. I mean, without Zoom, our economies would have ground to a halt without the technology to keep many of us working. It would have been an absolute disaster. Um, but equally, what were the things we were missing? We were missing this moment, we have to meet together in a group of people. We we're missing um, the, uh, the access to parks and being able to go outside and smell the air. Uh, when, when physically we were told it's only an hour a day you're allowed to go outside, you've got to be exercising, you can't sit down on the bench. Those were the things that really hurt, that were cut to our core and, and showed us what, what were important to us. It wasn't having the fanciest new iPhone. Um, these were enabling technologies. But, but equally, um, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm interested that, that you've come um, to where you have through landscape architecture, because what I know about landscape architecture, a friend of mine at the university was a landscape architect, Certainly in the UK, it's a seven-year course. Mm -hmm. It's a great course. And what they, as my understanding of what they did, was what we should be doing with technology people, right? Because <laughs> you cover so many aspects of how you change the environment around people. Money, stop it, please. <laughs> no, no. And, um, and, and the environmental impact. Uh, and there's so many different angles that, um, as a landscape architect, you look at, you look at the design and the, and the society of the people you're serving. Um, and I have to say, in technology, we don't have any of that. You know, we mm. you know, bring people up in two or three years just to how to build the technology uh, and um, whatever impact it's going to have on people. That, that's the price we have to pay. No, it's not surprising. What was the what was the Facebook um, Facebook's old motto, um, which was move fast and break things. I mean, they've now changed the motto to what, what, I'm trying to remember the exact move thing. fast with stable infrastructure. Move, move, move fast with stable infrastructure. <laughs> so inspiring. <Very> absurd. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, at heart, it's still moving fast and breaking things. <laughs> you can't take the Zuckerberg out of Meta. <laughs> I, I'm um, not sure if I've answered your question yet. I've got distracted. No, I think it's I think it's great. Um, I've always, uh, you know, I bring my uh, my training with me into all of this work. But I think one of the things that um, I've really carried with me is this understanding of systems. So, uh, in landscape, you you really need to have a a very solid grounding in understanding the influence of multiple systems on each other. Um, and I've, I've always found that very helpful, kind of moving into this space. In digital tech, we really haven't had that. I mean, it's start, starting to happen, right? So you, you can go and hear Genevieve Bell and cybernetics people talk about a much more systems focused thinking about the bigger picture and the institutions, the system system. And we have to do that because otherwise we're going to, you know, we're going to break our democracy. So. So the three themes that really spoke to me in this work um, were literacy, trust, and agency. Um, and I've got a few questions around each of those themes, if we could maybe dig into a little bit of those. Um, the first one was around literacy and this idea of a critical need for all of us to build a greater understanding about the technologies that we interact with. So what they are capable of, but also very much what they aren't capable of. Um, and that's kind of as much people thinking that uh, the, the, the world of minority report or um, the, the sort of advanced sci-fi that we all kind of engage with, or certainly I do, uh, is, is entirely possible. But when the reality is, I think you, you give a, a great example about the uh, example of the self-driving car and what, um, what their actual kind of logic is uh, when they're driving down a street. Um, and, uh, and then also the context that this technology is being developed within um, and therefore some of the inherent bias that comes with that. Um, and there are, there are a number of chapters, I think, where that theme comes through very strongly. And I wondered if maybe you could talk to, to some of that. Um, 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the good news there is, I mean, since I started I mean, about four or five years ago, writing these sequence of books written for the general public and having a, a more public conversations to try and help um, answer the questions that, that, that the media and the public had, the level of debate has, has improved significantly. I mean, I remember when it started, every conversation was about Terminator. <laughs> it's always about robots were just about to take over. We have much better, much more nuanced conversations, but there's still I think, a long way to go. I mean, you, you mentioned autonomous cars. I mean, there's a lot of debate when you hear about autonomous cars, about trolley problems. Is the, what, what are we going to do about the car that's driving down the road? Is it going to decide to um, you know, run over the pedestrian that's just stepped into the into the path of the car? Is it going to run into the brick wall and maybe kill the, uh, the occupant of the car? Not understanding that cars don't really understand the world. They, um, you know, I have friends who write code for, for self-driving cars and they will tell you, you, know, you ask them, where is the, what is the subroutine it branches into when it recognizes it's in one of these imminent crash situations. And they, they look at you blankly and they say, there's no such subroutine. The top level of the, the code of the car is literally drive, they, if you've ever seen a video presentation about self-driving car, you see this video of the car with its cameras and there's a bit of green road it's painted in front. They always paint the road green for some reason. Um, the green road is the road that's safe, clear to drive on, right? So it's the, the, literally the, the top level code of the self-driving car is drive on the green road. And if you can't see any green road to drive on, brake as hard as you possibly can. That's it. <laughs> that is how a self-driving car, so all the time it's, it's just, just trying to try, say, stay on the green road, stay on the green road, brake, 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 brake. That's all it ever does. Uh, <laughs> it, it's not making these uh, life or death decisions, you know, should I kill the two pedestrians? Right. All of this young child stepping on the road, that's much more valuable than the old occupant of the car. There's no understanding of the world to be able to make these sorts of decisions. Um, and yet parliaments have, have dis debated these issues. The, the, the Germans, the German parliament has passed a law um, saying um, a car cannot decide um, you know, based upon the age of the people, what, what, what decisions it's going to make. But cars have no idea, no understanding at all. So, and there's still a, still a long way to go, I think, for people to understand what the technology is. And it's, and it's and it's really important because if the technology is magic, then we are not going to be active participants. We are going to be led astray by the tech companies, led astray by people with bad intent. Oh. Um, and we we need to be literate in this. Oh in these technologies. Otherwise, we're not going to be active participants in the society that is being built. I, um, I did some work with the Department of Ed New South Wales Department of Education about this. And I was saying to them, I don't understand why we teach, we still teach people calculus. We used to live in a mechanical world where everything, where, you know, the most important machinery we came across was, was mechanical and calculus is the mathematics of, of movement of machinery. We now live in a largely digital world. We should make sure everyone is taught the basics of computation. Not not everyone is taught how to program. Not everyone is going to be needing to program, but to understand the capabilities of machines, the limitations of machines. Um, so the, the, the worst thing is when I get on a customer call and, and the person says, I'm sorry, it's a computer, we can't do that. And I, love because I, I know it's a computer, I know that's the one thing it could do. And if it was only programmed in the appropriate way. I'm just going to... Oh, we've lost you now. Excellent. I was just going to ask if you are online to please make sure you're on mute. We're picking up a few uh, discussions about what people are going to have for dinner tonight. Um, but I think uh, someone on the tech uh, admin has helped us out. Um, so on that, on that idea of technology is magic. Um, how much, so I, I had a, a friend of mine who works in the car industry the other day tell me that most vehicles that are released now, uh, their steering wheel is not connected directly to the axle uh, and is fully mediated by, yes. uh, by a computer. Therefore, the steering wheel in its current format is obsolete. Um, and yeah, make it easy to make this thing autonomous eventually, right? Of course, but there's something about maintaining the illusion of the level of control that we have 
um, that gives people comfort. And I wonder in this piece around literacy, so uh, if we understand, if we have I'm a concern that it's not physically connected anymore to the wheels. Um, in a plane, the joystick is not any more physically connected to the flaps. Anything. Um, it's a digital connection. So yeah. I think it's I think it's really interesting that it 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 causes alarm. I I polled a bunch of people to see how they felt about it, and everyone was everyone kind of went, oh, that's a bit oh, hmm. Uh, and then we're like, well, I guess it's okay. But there was there was this sort of disconnect of and and moment of alarm around uh, the way things worked were not quite as they expected. Well, that's true. This, so this is one of these strange intruder um, observations, right? So, uh, in, in my first book, actually, I talk about this, which is that we'll wake up one day and realize that we're not driving cars. <laughs> it's going to happen to us slowly, piece by piece. You're not looking very well in your rear view mirrors anymore, ladies and gentlemen, because we all have blind spot detectors and things that do that for us. And you increasingly expect cars to do that. And you're all of us are human, and so all of I notice I'm not being as observed. Mm -hmm. so depending on the tech, there's a little thing that tells warns me when I can't pull out, and I'm not such a good driver. And slowly, our ability to drive is being taken away from us, without us realizing. Um, and I do make this prediction in one of my books, which is, you will go to renew your license at one point, and the government will tell you. Well, I'm sorry, Toby, you haven't actually been driving the car very much. <laughs> Indeed, if you want to really drive the car again, you'll have to take your test because you've only spent, you know, two hours of the last 200, um, <laughs> 200 hours in your car driving and you're a bit out of uh, practice. And then I'll look at it and I think, oh, it's just too painful to pass my <laughs> test again. Um, I'll just switch to the fully autonomous mode now. And so that, that was actually kind of one of my... my questions coming up was around this um, this loss of agency and um, you talk about a couple of things in the book the mutant algorithm um, in the the case of um, the education system in the UK um, the role of um, AI and decision making in the justice system and warfare um, and this sort of shift in um, decision making where we abdicate responsibility or it's taken away from us and um, what happens to us when those decisions are taken away or offered away freely um, and how we acknowledge the the cost benefit of that you're, you're, you're right I mean so that was one of postman's lesson, lessons which was you know ask what the technology brings and ask also what it takes away from us and so with that so we stick on stick on driving for a second mm -hmm. so um, Map reading, right? we're the last, ladies and gentlemen, you are the last generation that knows how to read a map. Right? So one of those skills like subtraction that you were used to learn to do, um, but increasingly no one will be map reading. And, and that, that physically changes who we are. So they, they have done studies, F fMRI studies with uh, London taxi drivers when they do the knowledge, so year long uh, training to, to learn all the streets. They have to be able to go between any two places the quickest route between any two places in, in London. They drive around on their moped for a year and learn it to do. You can do studies on the hippocampus, the part of the brain for map reading, for spatial reasoning, and it gets 15% larger in London cabins. It physically, your brain physically expands to be able to do this task. So if you're not map reading, you're relying upon Google Maps to do it, then you know what else is your brain doing? It's not, it's not that, that part of the hippocampus is not getting larger to do that. So. And, and that's important because um, I, I can still navigate by the sun. Yeah, um, I mean, it was quite funny. But 15 years ago, when I moved to Australia, I remember I had to change my my internal navigation um, to realise that the sun yeah. was off north of me, not south. Right. UK, when the sun. Was off. But once I made that, I could then I, I could still navigate. Why well, I needed to go west? Which direction? Turning like a space. Which direction? Is it? Um, so those are those are important things to understand. The Earth goes around the sun, and why does the sun rise in the east in the morning, set in the west? All these things. 
that we might actually forget if we are uh, we no longer map reading um, and about our understanding of the of our position in the world. And so when we but, but really quickly, I, I think we should, so I don't want this to be an entirely negative story, right? So uh, as another example I give in the book, which is an, another technology which completely transformed us, right? Which was language, uh, especially written language. Right? Completely ch changed uh, us as a species that allowed us to be far smarter, far, far more intelligent because now you didn't have to learn everything fresh. You could just read a book and learn on the shoulders of the giants of all the people, all the generations that went before you. Mm. Um, and so when we invented language, we lost something really that was really important to us at the time, which was the oral tradition. We used to sit around the fire, say stories. We so we lost that completely. We don't sit and remember stories now, but we got something back, which was far better. We got literature. We got um, we got a mechanism for passing knowledge down between generations. And we got the works of Shakespeare. We got the, word, the works of Goethe. We got uh, stories that now transcend time and place. So we, I think, we got a really good deal in that case. We got literature for the we swapped it for the oral tradition. But equally, um, you know, I think we should ask this question seriously when we have AI. We give things up um, for the convenience of not being lost as much. <laughs> equally, <laughs> does that lose our touch with the planet on which we're walking? And so I think there's a, a couple of examples in the book, and I, I think the um, example about the, the sort of blaming the mutant AI, uh, the mutant algorithm um, is, is one that really stuck with me. And the other was uh, in the justice system around um, the likelihood for people to reoffend. Um, two tools that are being used by professionals to enhance their decision making. Um, and I'm interested in terms of what you see is happening to professions that are engaging with these kinds of tools regularly, um, how it's shifting their professional practice. So there's a particularly, exa uh, p particularly interesting example that you, you reference um, with um, judges in the US around um, this predictive capability of reoffense uh, and how that's playing into decision making um, and an inability in some cases to not um, go with their own personal judgment um, and professional judgment in with the concern around going against the AI. I think there's there's something really interesting at play in there, um, which re relates back to this idea around agency. Um, yeah, I mean, two, two things there. One, one is you've got is the cognitive bias. There's plentiful studies that show that people will defer to the judgment of a program um, far too easily. Um, if it's been right a couple of times, then they'll assume it's always going to be right. And then there's the legal bias, which is that a judge is clearly, probably in the US, is clearly going to be a bias to the... If they have to overrule the, the program, and then that person then goes off and commits an offence, and then they're exposing them to, to, to legal action. So, well, you didn't listen to the advice of the program. And so it's, a, it's they have to go out of the limb uh, not to, you know, follow the advice of the program and lock the person up. Um, but uh, the, the, the mutant algorithms, if anyone doesn't know what the mutant algorithms, that was a quote from Boris Johnson, it's a, it's a good friend, witticism, which was about the uh, automated marking of exams uh, during the course of the pandemic, because because people, because pupils couldn't sit exams uh, for the two years of the pandemic, and so they were using computers to make predictions, give people grades predicted on on their uh, coursework and their work up to there. What I mean, what's interesting about the mutant algorithms was that they weren't, they didn't mutate at all. They didn't change at all. They did exactly what they were specified to do, supposed to do. They were carefully programmed to make sure that there was no great inflation. They were carefully programmed um, to, to give out um, you know, the same grades with each school as had always been given out. But that statistically leveled everyone down. And so if you were a high performing student who got A grades and no one in your school was, was deserving to get A grades, no one in your school previously had ever got 
A grades. It was almost impossible for you to get A grades because it was making sure that there was there was no anonymous in in the data. And and so it the, the, they succeeded in, in doing exactly what they intended it to do, which was to, to give a statistically identical distribution of grades as was in the previous year. Mm -hmm. but, but failing to recognize that that would that would stop individual excellence being shown anymore, uh, individual grit uh, being able to shine through. Um, and and inter interestingly enough, in the first year of the pandemic, uh, the big announcement was that human human yeah. teachers are not going to be involved in grading because we know that human teachers are all biased and they'll have favorites in the class and people that they don't like and so we'll make sure it's an unbiased computer. No humans will be involved. And then in the second year of the pandemic, they said the opposite. They said no computers will be involved, only humans, <laughs> which is swinging from one extreme as usual to the other. Um, but I think what it highlights there is is really that we we built an institution. It highlighted the injustices of the institution that we already had because you took agency away from people. We, you, you mentioned agency as being important, here, but it was the agency of people to to ace the exams, to try extra hard and and do better than anyone had done better in their, in, in, had, had done in their school before. And you took that agency away from people. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we're, if we're ever building systems that take agency away from people, their, their harsh light is, should be shined on them because, because people will find them very unjust. Um, and, and I think it highlighted how unjust the system is. That we put too much emphasis on how you perform on a particular day and somehow we sort of rationalize this to ourselves because we think, oh, well, you can ace the exams, and you can do well. Or well, suddenly we change the system so you could, and you, you, you just pointed out that we were going to make sure that if you went to a, a low performing school, you were going to be marked down as a, as a low performing student. Um, and those decisions have such important ramifications into our lives. They, they determine the universities you go to, they determine the jobs you get. Um, and so these are really high stakes things. And it, I think, you know, the system as a whole has been broken for many years. And by automating this final part of it, we just demonstrated how broken it was. Mm -hmm. And so you talk quite at, at length about bias um, in, in a range of contexts in the book. But one of the, the critical areas is around, uh, was it the sea of dudes? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that? So this was a phrase um, uh, made, invented by Melanie Mitchell, who was famously fired from Google not so long ago, um, saying that one of the challenges of the field I work in um, is that it is largely white male people like myself, um, and there are there's very few women, very few people of colour, very few minorities represented, and that that has unfortunate consequences. One is that um, uh, there are many biases that creep into into code and into product because um, there are a diversity of people in the room asking the right questions. So, as an example, when Google first put out, sorry, not Apple first put out the uh, the Apple Watch, um, and it included various health tracking data, um, it would track various things. It didn't track menstrual cycle, which you know, if you want to understand the health of a woman. Uh, understanding her menstrual cycle is a pretty important uh, thing to be tracking um, to understand even body temperature and many other things. And it was only one or two years into into the release of, the, of that product that they actually got round to including in the API menstrual tracking as an, as an integral part of the health kit. Um, because and this is the, 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 the sea of doom, it's, um, that, that um, we have to be very careful when we're building code because the frustrating thing when you are a coder is you discover that computers are incredibly literal devices. They do only what you tell them to do. They do exactly what you tell them to do, which is anyone who's had to debug programs know. It keeps on doing the same bloody same thing. It's, it, it doesn't do what you intended to do. It does what it's programmed to do. Um, and so when we're programming them to make these sometimes delicate decisions, we have to think very carefully. Well, what what do we want it to what do we want it to do? And and there are, we discovered there are these are deep fundamental questions about the sort of society we want to build. They're about what does it mean to be fair and just? And there are many different ways, many different at least mathematical ways of, of, of saying what fairness is. And so in the machine learning community, there are currently at least twenty one 
mathematical definitions of fairness, many of them are incompatible with it, with each other. Is it you know equality of opportunity, equality of outcome? Um, there are many different ways of defining what it is to be fair. The law has other ways as well of defining what it is to be fair. And society has other ways of perceiving what they feel is fair as well. As well. And they're not compatible with each other. So they're all about asking, well, what is it that we want? Um, and I mean, I think you know, one of the things I say in the book is that the, ne the next um, couple of decades could be the golden age of philosophy. That philosophy will have to help us address some really deep fundamental problems about the society we are trying to build um, based upon, you know, having we're going to hand some of these decisions to machines, then we're going to have to think very carefully, exactly, specify in precise ways for the, the code to run what it is to be fair. Equally, I also say in the book, I think there are some decisions we just, we should never hand to machines, even if machines, even in the case that machines can make those better decisions. There are, there are plentiful places in high stake settings in the judiciary, um, in the military and elsewhere, where I think if we handed those decisions to machines, even if you could argue on some utilitarian or other perspective that this would make the world a better place, that we would be giving up a really integral part of our, of our society, of our humanity, of our compassion, of our empathy. What would happen to the size of uh, the brains that make that part of the decision making, like if we our brains, up. yeah, if our brains change so much from not reading maps, what happens if we? Yes, uh, our, our, our empathetic brains might atrophy as well. Exactly. Added empathy to the machines, but I don't think I don't think machines are going to be any good at empathy. It's only <laughs> answer today, and it's not clear if they would be because they lack. And in the, and in the book, I go into there's a chapter on this. I go into some detail about. It is artificial intelligence. It's not the same as natural intelligence. There's some things the machines don't have. They don't have emotions. They, they're not mortal. They're not going to die. They're not going to lose a loved one. Um, those are, you know, the, the unique human experiences. Are the, some of, some of the most important machines will never have. And therefore, they can never relate to humans because they will never experience life in the way that we experience life. I did yeah. love your um, extended reference to uh, my octopus teacher um, and well, the alien fantastic. intelligence. Yes. One of the best things to come out of the pandemic. Um, yes, if you didn't by any chance <laughs> uh, watch um, my octopus teacher during the pandemic, please go home and watch it. You'll, you will love it. You will, you will, it's a fantastic movie. Yeah, the, the, the way you compare the intelligence of an octopus uh, and its nine brains um, and the way we reframe what artificial intelligence could be, I think, is, is really powerful. Uh, and the role that it can play in augmenting human intelligence is quite a, a separate thing rather than trying to recreate it in our own image. Yeah, so I think we're coming back to your question at the start, one of education, which is, one thing I, 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 I try to get people to understand is that is that we call it artificial intelligence. It might be a very artificial intelligence, very different intelligence. And the example, as you say, I give in the book is, is the one of the octopus, because that that is the closest that we know of on the planet of what might be an alien intelligence. So the, the, the octopus is, is remarkable in so many different ways. It is clearly very intelligent. It's the only uh, invertebrate um, that is protected under uh, European law from uh, experimentation. Mammals, of course, are protected because they've got they've got you know highly developed nervous systems, um, and we you know we therefore relate to them. But the only invertebrates are protected of, of, of the um, octopus family because they have immense intelligence. They are um, so it depends. You know we have very different ways of defining intelligence. One way of defining intelligence: is, Are you a tool user? Uh, and octopuses are tool users. You can give an octopus a um, a uh, screw top jar and it, with food inside, and it will learn to open the screw top jar to get the food inside. There's an octopus that famously learned how to turn the lights off by squirt by squirting water. To uh, uh, it was in this um, uh, laboratory, and the scientists would go home at light night, leaving the bright 
lights on, which stopped the octopus from having a nice sleep. So it learned to squirt, squirt, squirt water out of the lights to fuse the lights. And the scientists would come back uh, in the morning and discover the lights were fused. There was a puddle <laughs> of water underneath. Couldn't figure out what was going on. So eventually they put a camera up and saw when they walked out, the, the octopus had learned to, 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 to fuse the lights <laughs> and to have some peace and quiet. So they're, they're, they're very intelligent. They, um, people who, the scientists who work with them claim that they can recognize faces. They have distinct personalities. People who work with them uh, will give them different names because they clearly have very different personalities. They're, so they're, they, they clearly have some you know, significant intelligence. And obviously, they're, they're pretty conscious of their surroundings, able to, to reason quite sophisticatedly. And yet, um, their biology is completely just separate to ours. As you said, the 60% of their brain is in their, is in their eight legs. You know, if you're going to walk with eight legs, you've got to have pretty distributed intelligence to be able to control the legs. Um, and, um, we're, I mean, you know, all, all life on Earth is evolved from the same single cell forms. You know, we, we share the same genetic code with everything. So, and you know, the theory of evolution tells us that, that we've all evolved from the same single cell of life. Um, so you could look at the, the, the sophisticated tree of life that we've drawn up and say, OK, um, Octopus is over here in the invertebrate branch of the tree of life, and we're over here in the mammal uh, tree of life. Where is our, uh, our, our closest common ancestor? And you have to go back something like 70 million years to the point in which there were um, the most sophisticated life forms only had um, you know, hundreds or thousands of cells. So there wasn't, wasn't any intelligence at all pretty much then. Um, their intelligence has evolved completely separate to ours. And so it's the closest, you know, Want to know what the aliens are going to look like? They're going to look like octopus. <laughs> our best, our best guess. Um, hey, speaking of alien intelligence, um, yes. Elon Musk makes several appearances in the pages of the book. Uh -huh. Yes, well, I, I have had the pleasure to meet him actually. <laughs> um, I, he's he's in the news a lot at the moment. Um, I wondered if maybe in the context of um, this discussion, I could draw you into making a prediction about how you think things might play out with Twitter if he's successful in his current endeavours? Uh, I doubt it's going to be successful. I, doubt, I think there's a financial argument it's not going to be successful. And I'm surely there must be a regulatory uh, reason that it can't be that our most important town squares are the playthings of billionaires. That is not a healthy uh, place for democracy to move to. Um, it's not an easy job to work out the boundaries of free freedom of speech. It's a really difficult, messy thing. Um, and we struggle and we will continue to struggle to work out how we can, how, you know, how I can protect your right to say things, but at the same time, uh, not end up in a society where hate speech, where uh, Nazism and fascism is, is procreated. Um, it, these are these are not easy questions, and I don't think billionaires are any privileged position to be able to answer these questions better than governments. But the mm -hmm. best thing about governments is that, well, democratic governments at least, is that we get to re-elect them. They do have to be answerable to us. They are governments for the people, by the people. Billionaires are not for the people or by the people. Um, and so I think it would be a terrible idea um, if um, Elon en ended up in charge of Twitter. Um, I suspect he may fall through just because the stock market's going to tank. It's going to fall through because he's going to move on to his next plaything, um, mm. and his, his purpose is 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 other than to necessarily um, do good. Um, I think, and maybe I can get a, a thumbs from Marina. Yeah, if we're coming up on time. I wanted to like like your book. So I'll I'll finish on one question, and then maybe we can open it up to the digital and uh, physical floor. Um, so I wanted to finish with a quote from, from you, from your book, um, finishing on something of an upbeat trajectory like, uh, like your book does. So what is the greatest gift these intelligent machines can give us? In the long term, I suspect it will be a greater appreciation, perhaps even enhancement of our own humanity. Intelligent machines could actually make us better humans. So given the state of the world today, Toby, please tell us how AI can make us better humans. 
Uh, well, I've got to paraphrase the end of the book now. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I did try to end an up, upy way. I'm a, a glass glass half full person in the long term, even if I think it's a very bumpy glass half empty next couple of years that face us as we deal with many of the wicked problems from the climate emergency to to the geopolitical terrorists that we see happening in East, Eastern Europe today. Um, but, you know, technologies are the only reason that we live better quality lives than our grandparents. And we have, you know, I think the, sadly the politicians have let us down a bit in the last ten, two decades um, dealing with some of the challenges like climate. Um, that we are going to have to embrace technologies to deal with some of the wicked problems. But equally, I think it will give us a realization, you know, what will be important, what will separate us from the machines is our humanity. Hopefully it will give us, if we manage it right, and we spread the benefits fairly and equitably, we'll have more time to do the things that are important to us. You know, if at the end of people's lives, you know, they don't sit on, you don't sit on your, uh, in your bed saying, you know what, I wish I'd spent more time in the office. You say, I wish I spent more time with my family. I wish I spent more time in my community. I spent more time making art, more time reading books, more time doing the important things. Or, you know, in my case, more time writing books. Uh, but, um, you know, making, making, the, you know, making the world and society a better place. And if, the, you know, the one thing that this alien intelligence, this artificial intelligence, tells us about, it will make us um, appreciate more and more uh, those human values, those things the machines don't have, uh, as, I, as I said before, you know, our empathy, our emotional intelligence, our social intelligence, those will be the things, those will be the values that are most important in the jobs of the future. Those are the characteristics that humans will have that will be, uh, are, that will be the edge that we always, I suspect, will always keep on the machines. And therefore, you know, whilst our technological future for our machines is one of, you know, infinite precision and, um, and you know endless data the ones for us is all i think all about increasing emphasis on our humanity and you already see that today you already see that in hipster culture you always really see this appreciation for these really old-fashioned values of you know artisan bread and handmade cheese and, and going back to the things that again to go back to the pandemic the things that brought us um comfort in that time where we're you know making um, sourdough bread that was the thing that united us it wasn't a it wasn't a zoom call <laughs> toby Walsh, thank you very much uh thank you. it's been an absolute pleasure and uh i encourage everyone to to go get a copy that's a question so we might do a couple of questions from the audience and then Bonnie, if you wouldn't mind facilitating one or two questions. Yeah, we don't, want, in the chat. We don't want the people online to fill second glasses. <laughs> Absolutely. I will find some good ones. To my, my friends online, throw your questions in the chat and I will, I've got your back. This might be a naive question, um, but has the Australian government or any legal bodies in Australia made any new laws around AI so far? Any examples you know of? So, so the, the question, body is, has the Australian government made any new laws around AI? Um, no. The um, EU AI Act is is being uh, formed as we speak, and that's the, I think, uh, I'm safe to say that is the first case of a generic piece of legislation devoted to AI. I'm not sure that we're going to have, you know, I mean, that it's interesting to to have that, and I think we'll see other countries, you know, EU laws tend to be quite viral, which is a good thing. Um, so I think we might see similar things happen slowly here. But um, much uh, regulation of AI, I think, is better done perhaps within the, within the particular industries in which it's been applied, as opposed to, it is a generic technology, but equally the problems tend to be specific to the domain. So we have regulation around autonomous driving, which is only tells you about autonomous driving or regulation about, um, you know, the use of AI for credit lending, um, you know, that should be applied in general credit lending, credit lending law. Um, I don't think there's too much you can say. That, just like we don't have generic regulation for electricity. Uh, we have, you know, specific regulation for applications of electricity. 
specific regulation for applications of AI. Yeah, what seems to me to be a classic case of uh, machines behaving badly, I'm not sure it falls under really your definition, which adversely affected many lives, and that was RoboDebt. And I think we're going to have an inquiry into, into RoboDebt. I'm just wondering what your, your thoughts are, that that's just fall within your definition of machines behaving badly, and what you think might um, or should be the outcome of this inquiry that we're going to have. Uh yeah, I, it would fall in my my remit of machines behaving badly, because precisely, so uh, Bonnie, this is about RoboDebt, um, because precisely it comes back to Bonnie's um, question around agency, was that these letters were sent out automatically with no human involved, despite the fact the government was told there will be errors mis made, and those errors are catastrophic. People took their lives, right? And, and if you are thinking about how to vote, um, I believe Scott Morrison was seriously involved in the, in the <laughs> rolling out of this. So you may want to bear that in mind. Come to put your X on the piece of paper. Um, no, I think heads should roll. Um, they were too, it, was, it was clear, clearly going to, mistakes were going to be made. Um, and they should have left a human in the loop as, as uh, you know, they were just greedy for efficiency gains um, and not caring for the people um, that, that was going to impact their lives, and it was seriously. These people were you know, didn't have much money to to start off with. That's what they were claiming welfare. Um, you know, we should we, we should be much more careful with these people, and, and much less careful with billionaires. Do you think we'll see any any major change in the way they do this in the future coming out of it? They've learned their lessons. Uh, it was very clear the government has learned its lesson. Mm. Well, I don't, I'm not sure it learned its lesson. Very clear the government has noticed this. And you certainly saw um, um, a reluctance for government to go down various roads as a, as a consequence. They're not wanting to have more egg on their face. Whether they've learned the lesson so it doesn't happen again, I'm not so sure. Um, but so, as, as an example, um, slightly off the, off, the, off the record remark, um, when we wrote the um, horizon scanning report for the government to advise them how to deal with AI in the future, we included RoboDebt as one of the examples. The government was very upset. It, made, it was very clear that we had to remove that example. Interestingly enough, there was a almost identical uh, situation happened in um, the state of Michigan, I think it was, and in, in the, the United UK, States, well, sure. and in the UK. Okay. And there's a similar thing happened in, uh, was, it, uh, was it Holland or uh, Belgium, yeah. where, the, in fact, it caused the, caused the government to have to resign. Um, so there's plentiful examples, sadly, really sadly, around the world that you can put a substitute for the robot debt. Make the same point, but but we you know we come back to this point of agency. You want to have people still involved who have people's common sense and also who can be held accountable. Because machines can't be held accountable. It strikes me in reading uh, the work that there's an inherent challenge around scale. So if you have the ability to massively scale a small group of people's values that uh, has then the ability to affect a, a much larger group than uh, it traditionally would, you start to run into a whole lot of pretty significant problems. Online. There's a good one online here. Yeah. Can we just take the one for the back? I've already. yeah. yeah, you're you're right. But I mean, so the, the question then is, is that the best place for the, should the, should we be handing responsibility to courts to dealing with this or should we actually ask our legislators to, to actually play with all this debates around discussion around Davos and the could AI is invented or so on? It seems to be a bit of an ask to have the courts be deciding this when probably we should actually have the considered should have considered thought from our parliamentary bodies deciding 
legislation falls to the courts interpreting old legislation. Bonnie, online questions. Thank you. I've got one here from Scott Phillips. Um, should a potentially harmful AI be dumbed down, that is trained not to be able to do things that may cause harm, or should we instead ensure that the human agents controlling them are identifiable and legally responsible for their actions? Well, I, th I think there are settings where we should always have humans, high stakes settings where humans should always be held accountable. Because machines can't be punished, machines don't, don't have our conscience, they're, they're not moral beings, um, they're the wrong stuff. Um, you, know, I know, you know, I know that we have given um, you know, um, personhood to corporations and I'm not sure that that was a very good idea. Um, we certainly, uh, discovering now, holding corporations to account is not as easy as we thought it was perhaps. Um, so I, I'm certainly very against the idea that we should invent a new type of, you know, legal personhood that machines can inhabit, um, because I think that's, that's a recipe again for having a lack of accountability. Um, Doug, if I can just jump in on that and um, give some context, the, the context for this is um, what OpenAI have recently um, previewed on their DALI 2 system, which um, will turn uh, an English written sentence into a visual image. And um, my understanding is that they are they're not releasing that until they've, um, to the general public at least, uh, until they've um, hobbled it or made it, um, you know, not understand pornography, for example, um, and, and, and not be able to um, look up um, celebrities and that sort of thing. Um, so rather than um, hobble, technology or artificial intelligence um, systems, um, it seems that the, the alternative might be to um, be able to um, assign that kind of responsibility in a, in a, um, in a non-reputable way. I'm wondering what you think about that. Well, there's, I mean, there's a technical challenge there is, is it's very unclear whether you could actually effectively hobble the technology to remove all the harms. Certainly, We've struggled to do that in the past with, with other you know, large language models and other examples of that, that it seems nigh on impossible because these, these programs don't really understand what they're doing. Um, GPT-3 doesn't really understand language, so it has no idea when it's being offensive. Um, DALI has no understanding of pornography to understand. Well, humans have very poor understanding of pornography to expect machines to have a good understanding of what is pornography, what is art even. Right? Those, are, those are very difficult questions. So I, I'm very sceptical that they can actually effectively follow this route of hobbling the system that it can be released without worrying about um, questions of liability and questions of it, it behaving in bad ways. Well, another interesting um, consequence of that is that there are now other um, uh, AI research groups that are attempting to accelerate past where um, DALI 2 are at with this application um, with seemingly no concern for the ethics of what they're doing, but just it's a race to get in front of them. So it seems that the, um, the care that's being taken um, could be a, a, a bit of a ball and chain on, on a particular application. Yeah, I, this, I mean, I think this is a criticism you could make of Silicon Valley as a whole, which is that um, there has, there is perhaps not enough regulation and control, and too much driven by profits and venture capital, um, and that has led to plentiful examples in the book of bad outcomes, and we will have, if we're not careful that particular. And then there's also a um, international jurisdictional problem there as well, because. Um... Uh, there'd be a lot of those um, competing projects that, that aren't based in um, the US, aren't based in um, what we'd call the West. But, but I, I think on a, on a positive note, you're seeing increasingly politicians waking and regulators waking up to the idea that they have a really important role to regulate. I mean, there was a time uh, half a dozen years ago where people thought, you know, there were lots of people who would say, you couldn't and you shouldn't regulate these sorts of spaces. You couldn't because 
they were digital, they crossed national boundaries, it was somewhat different from the physical world and you shouldn't because this was going to stifle innovation and growth and productivity. And now um, many people say you can and you should, you can, well, we've, there's a number of examples of successful regulations like GDPR, which have shown that you can gain back privacies. Um, and you should, because otherwise um, these um, worst behaviours uh, will just get worse and worse. And uh, interestingly enough, the most effective place to do that regulation is at the national level. You see this, you know, you see the very effective national regulation, national including the EU. Um, but, but whether that be the regulation that was brought into place after the terrible tragedy in Christchurch here in Australia, um, that you said we'll hold those, these, these platforms accountable um, for offensive content if it's not taken down quickly enough, and that has certainly helped to address that problem. It hasn't solved the problem, you really know, but it certainly has made that problem much less of a problem, and certainly uh, we would hope you know, other things um, continue. And I spend a lot of time now talking to politicians and telling them about this. Uh, you know, I think you know, um, micro-targeting of political adverts is one area we should have some more regulation on. That's what I told Bill Shorten last time I was in his office. <laughs> hey, uh, I'm going to take one more question. Dean, um, you've uh, shown some enthusiasm to get this question out there. So uh, for Toby, can you envisage code in all AI, let it go, oh, in all AI that embodies the law of the land? No. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> no, the law, <laughs> way. The law is it's written in language. Um, and so it has to, and language has to be interpreted, and that that gives that you know the wonderful structure where you have judges in, in their infinite wisdom who learn how to interpret it and deal with new new technologies that were not thought of when the when the law was written, um, and um, it gets interpreted according to how society changes over time, um, and the the, wor the the worst nightmare nightmare to wake up into is the world in which. You know, and this is one that various authors have told us about, is one in which law is regulated by machines, uh, coldly and empathically tell you, I'm sorry, you can't do that, Toby. <laughs> so just so that we don't finish on that note, um, <laughs> I, I might just throw to one one last question um, from Doug Maloney in, uh, in the chat here. Oh, are we still on? Yes, we're still on. Okay, uh, screen just changed. Um, so uh, asking, are there any design frameworks available to tech companies to head off ethical issues over time as their products evolve? So are there people codifying ways to bake in ethics and get in front of some of these big challenges so that we can all become better humans? Uh, yes, so I can answer in a positive way. Um, <laughs> so there are various ethical frameworks being developed um, IEEE, the large professional organization in this space, is developing it. ISO is developing some standards. Um, my friends at the Grading Institute for various business sectors like insurance developing frameworks. There's the um, Australian government's ethical framework, which I am um, partly responsible for. Um, but it's important to, work, to, to point out, of course, that you can't reduce this to a checklist. It's about having a diverse set of people in the room who ask difficult questions early on um, and think carefully about the people who's, who are going to be touched by this technology and whether, first of all, even that we should do AI, whether you know, this is another robo debt in waiting, um, whether we should leave humans in, in the loop here, whether trying to automate this decision completely is itself fundamentally flawed. Um, and so you want you know, a diverse, inclusive set of people in the room who um, come from all backgrounds, come from the humanities, come from law, um, come from anthropology, come from sociology, as well as come from technology, um, who ask these questions. And you know, I think many, many companies, um, many law firms, um, <laughs> many people are waking up to that realization. It's not, not easy questions. They're not easy questions because um, I come back to a, something I said at the start, because ultimately they're about what sort of society we are trying to build. Loki uh, had a, a great comment there. We have to have humans all the way down. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'll, I'll wrap up things online here um, and on behalf of everyone.
calling in and say thank you so much for your time, Toby. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure. Um, the book's awesome. I encourage everyone to read it. Uh, it's, a good, it's a cracker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Toby, on behalf of everyone yeah, at thank you. the Australian Society of Computers and the Law and Barhead. Thank you so much for coming and speaking about your book. As I said, it's a pleasure to be in a room full of people. <laughs> um, so to everyone online, I'm sorry you can't smell the lovely smell of pizza, um, <laughs> but um, please stay and have a drink and have something to eat. If you've got any other questions for Toby, please, um, I'm sure he'll stick around. Yeah, some questions yes. here, and if you're online, um, I'm sure he's happy for you to reach him on on um, 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 Yes. And so just a couple of um, other housekeeping questions. So um, the slide before, so there's a couple of events coming up um, from the Australasian Society of Computers and the Law. Um, this week, it's a busy week for those of us that are also going to the Legal Tech Fest and there's the Corporate Council Day. Um, there is also an expert panel on AI and facial recognition on Thursday, um, as well as another event um, that, that evening. Um, and so just to, just to end on a slight note, just a little bit about Barhead. Um, so uh, Barhead are a Microsoft implementation partner. So uh, including that, that thought into the way we design our t systems is all, it's, you know, very much front and centre. Um, and we also want to make sure that, you know, as Toby said, who, code, who codes matters, you know, how we code matters um, and what we code matters. And so it really is an integral part of something that I do, which is a lot of the intersection between legal technology um, Microsoft and the law, um, and so here at Barhead we are also, also focusing on the legal industry, developing applications for teams, for lawyers, procurement teams and other co corporations to better use um, the systems and processes in place for matter management and contract lifecycle management. So feel free to come and speak to any of us about it after the event. Um, and next week we're launching a new series um, specifically in the area of Microsoft for lawyers. So we'd love for as many of you to attend as possible. Um, it's being run on LinkedIn Live. So just jump on our event page on LinkedIn and uh, uh, click to attend. Um, I think that's, that's it for me. Again, thank you everyone for coming. It's lovely to see you face to face. And thank you once again to Toby.